Welcome back to This Week. Time now to get the views of our media and political experts, Nashville Democratic State Representative Brenda Gilmore and syndicated talk show host Steve Gill. Welcome. Almost Thank Thanksgiving. You. The Thank holidays you. around the corner. We now have a new speaker nominee, not quite a speaker yet, but although it looks like it's probably going to happen with Beth Harwell. And a little bit of a surprise, I think. I think the, the, the thinking on the legislative plaza on the Hill down there was that Glenn Cassidy, the more conservative candidate, may have had an edge here, but it didn't work out that way. Well, when you've got a huge conservative political year, when you have candidates who've run as conservatives, as Tea Party candidates, and then they vote the more moderate rhino in, instead of the, the more conservative, I think that is a bit of a shock. And, and frankly, I guess we shouldn't be shocked. Politicians lie. They <laughs> lied to their constituents in this case, and they lied to Glenn Cassidy. He had people look him in the eye, say they were voting for him with enough numbers to win. So not only are they lying to him, they lied to their constituents. Well, I'm very excited about it. One is we have representation from Middle Tennessee. Two, it's going to possibly be the first female mm -hmm. speaker, and I think that that's exciting in the history of Tennessee. And three, she's already made it very clearly that she's going to be focused on creation of jobs, and that's exactly what we need to be doing over the next few months, not some of the social issues that get in our way and divide us even more, uh, such as guns and abortions and gays and other type of topics. But a very narrow focus on creating jobs. What we don't know is how close this election was because the, the vote is a secret vote. We do know that Beth Harwell won. Whether she won by one vote or 40 votes, we don't know. Mm -hmm. And I guess the question is, you're a member, your, your votes are secret as well. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Does it just cause division among among the party if it's public? Or should people know that what they're, who, whose side their elected officials are on? I, I think that for this... For this specific cause, the secret vote is fine because once the vote is over, the parties and the caucuses need to come together and, and to move forward. If not, some of those same feelings would be taken on the floor, and I think it would get in the way of us being focused on Tennessee business. I think the problem is that, that secrecy is something that the voters said they're done with. I mean, we saw Obamacare and a lot of stuff coming out of Washington over the last couple of years done in secret behind closed doors, and the voters, I think, in this election were saying, we've had enough of mm -hmm. that. We want transparency. And as much as it pains me to admit, Nancy Pelosi <laughs> just had a House leadership position in the Democratic caucus in Washington where she ran against Heath Schuler. It was a public vote. We know the numbers. People had to stand up and be counted. As much as it pains me to admit it, Brenda, <laughs> The Democrats in the U.S. House, led by Nancy Pelosi, are more honest and transparent than the Republican House caucus because they're hiding in the weeds while at least the Democrats in Washington were open. Well, you know, it's no different than when we go in and we vote for a president. We, we can say who we're going to vote right. for, but once we go behind that, that uh, curtain, we can vote for whomever we choose. Tea Party the folks, general. the gun advocate folks, were not supporters of Beth Harwell. She says that's water under the bridge. Is this still going to be a divide? I think it will be, and I think that she didn't help close the divide after she won by basically thumbing her nose at the Tea Party by saying, well, I don't care what the Tea Party says, the Republican Party is unified. Uh, I think you're going to see over the next 18 months a lot of these Republican freshmen and others get, get uh, challenged in primaries because they've proved by this election that they're not as conservative as they said on the campaign trail. They're going to have votes that are going to further expose that. I think you're going to see Republican Party primary challenges in 18 months, and I think you're going to see the Tea Party and disaffected conservatives say a pox on both your houses. You're going <laughs> to see independent third-party candidates that are not going to hand power, I think, back to the Democrats in two years, but I think you'll More give challenges. back 14 of these seats. You may give back half of them. I think she's trying to do what Democrats have always done, to welcome a lot of different kinds of people who don't all necessarily look just alike into the party. And I think she's trying to welcome the Tea Parties into the Republican Party because most of them nationally are Republicans anyway. And, and uh, Beth is pretty moderate. I think she's going to govern uh, from the middle. And that, uh, that that's exactly what if I got any message from the last election. It was that the citizens are tired of us fussing and bickering. They want us to be focused on making this country stronger, getting the economy back on its feet, and most of all, getting people back to work. Two years ago, the Democrats were able to convince one Republican to come over, and effectively Kent Williams became the, the speaker, a big surprise to Jason Mumpower, who was the nominee. Beth, Beth Harwell is the nominee this year, unless there is an internal coup because the GOP has 14-plus in the majority, 
she's going to be elected the next speaker. It's not going to happen like it did two years ago. Well, she's made it very clear that she was not going to uh, work out any kind of proposal with the Democrats, and they have enough votes <coughs> to get one of them elected. I don't expect that Representative Castor is going to oppose her on the floor. He's so. kind of said he wouldn't. So. so I'm thinking that she's probably going to be the next speaker. There will be a lot of Democrats that will vote for her mm -hmm. uh, but just because it's viewed as being the more moderate of the, of the two. But um, I think she has enough votes. Yeah, I think I think Britt is right. The Democrats are very excited about Beth Harwell. That's why I think Republicans are concerned. Uh, I think some of her lieutenants, uh, Joe McCord, said actively he was trying to put together a coalition, if she didn't win the caucus, to bring Democrats and 13, 14 disaffected Republicans to elect her. Now she's saying that we don't need to worry about that. And I think she's right because the Democrats did get their pick. Well, and we're excited because, again, we care about people and we want people back to work. We don't want to spend the next six months talking about guns and bars and guns and parks. We want to talk about how do we create jobs and bring that unemployment of 9.4 down to at least 8% or 7%? I think Glenn Castor made it clear, though, during his campaign that, that his focus was going to be on exactly that. I think that uh, plenty of folks were saying from the Tea Party movement, the conservative side, that those were not the issues that were going to be the focal point. It was going to be jobs, jobs creation, and more importantly, how you balance a budget. We've talked before that we've got a billion-dollar budget shortfall in Tennessee. The stimulus money is gone. The rainy day fund is gone. It's going to be about cuts, not new spending, not all these other issues. I think regardless of who the House Speaker was, that's going to be I think it was probably a pretty close vote. Any suggestion, any guess out there, did Governor-elect Haslam have any any input into how these votes were decided was was a vote or two change maybe on his suggestion there are plenty of rumors on capitol hill <laughs> that he and or his people were strong arming folks uh, for beth harwell i think that eventually that also creates problems for him i think when you look at his transition team it is populated by uh, tom ingram a democrat lewis levine a liberal probably democrat mark cates in knoxville who nobody really knows what his political philosophy is so he's not reached out to the conservative base if his first cabinet official nominees are all left of center or moderates too, I think he's creating problems for his administration, certainly, but I think more for Bob Corker, who does have to face the voters in two years. I think we have to face reality. She co-chaired his campaign, and uh, he probably felt like that there was some allegiance there, and the word on the street is that he provided some assistance. I think both of those uh, representatives were good, were good uh, candidates. Uh, I'm very pleased that we have someone from Nashville that's going to be speaker. In First time in a long time, too. It's been yes. a long time since a, a Nashvillean's been speaker. In Rutherford County, uh, the temporary end anyway to a controversy, a judge has ruled that the mosque construction can continue in Rutherford County, the Islamic Center. It doesn't really end the controversy, does it? And it looks like some of the folks who oppose it may challenge it on other issues. Yeah, I think we've said on this show for a long time that at the end of the day, unless there was something forthcoming in this hearing that was pretty dramatic, this was going to move ahead right. to construction. It's a lot different from the Ground Zero Mosque in New York. You don't have the the affinity for this particular site that I think would, would move this aside. Now, over time, I think if we find that there is evidence that this particular mosque, these particular proponents, do have connections to terrorism, if, God forbid, anything should ever come out of this mosque like we've seen in the Northern Virginia Mosque that made the same pitch years ago, if we start seeing terrorists and dead Americans come from this mosque, there's going to be a whole lot of I told you so in addition to the grieving. Well, I think we have to move our personal feelings and emotions out of the way and respect the fact that religious uh, freedom has always been respected here in this country. It would be the same if a Jewish uh, synagogue wanted to be built or a Baptist church wanted to be mm -hmm. built. So this is no different. The difference is you don't have folks with those uh, religious beliefs right now in this world in this country planning plotting and carrying out terror attacks in the name of that religion and i think there's a freedom of religion but there also has to be a recognition of reality these exact mosques with the exact same funding that's going into places like this mosque are fomenting terrorism in this country well the, for sure there are some terrorists out there and we need to take action against them however we don't need to classify all muslims as terrorists and i don't think, and I think that that gets do in that. the way i think i think it's not that all muslims are terrorists but all the muslims these days are, are all the terrorists these days are Muslims. And, you know, when we look at what the TSA is doing at the airports, you know, gripping and groping people, they're Another discussion. Steve <laughs> Gilbrand and Gilmore, appreciate your time and your insight. Stay with us. This week continues in a moment.